Mernin, let's talk about type 2 diabetes and herbs. Can we treat type 2 diabetes with herbs and spices that we find in our kitchen cupboard? So yes, and uh, I guess my interest in diabetes and herbs first started when I was working in, in Africa, in uh, Mali in West Africa. And uh, people there use a local plant called Moringa, mm. which actually is not such a local plant because it's found in many places in the tropics. Um, and the leaves are incredibly nutritious. They contain protein, vitamins, minerals, and in fact, they're promoted as a treatment for, for malnutrition. Um, but in, in, in Mali in West Africa, they also use it as a treatment for diabetes. And um, some friends, researchers in Mali, wanted to do a clinical trial of it. So I supported them to do that. And there were some really interesting results in that they gave people 100 grams of white bread, gave them some moringa afterwards, a gram or two grams, and then measured their blood sugar levels, you know, every uh, 10 minutes or so. And they found that the blood sugar levels in people who'd taken the moringa were lower by about one millimole per liter. Okay, yeah, uh, so that's quite those, significant. Yeah, quite yeah. significant compared to those who hadn't. I and mean, obviously that's a very short term measure of mm. um, diabetes. So in clinical practice as GPs, we look more at a thing called HbA1c, which is the percentage of your red blood cells that are coated with sugar molecules. And it's a measure of how well your diabetes has been controlled over a period of two, three months. Um, and so I decided, why don't we look and see what research is out there, what has already been done, on different plants for treating diabetes and specifically what is their effect on HbA1c mm. on the long-term control of diabetes. And to our surprise, we found that there had already been 34 systematic reviews of randomized controlled trials. 34? Yeah, that's a lot. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but one randomized that. controlled trial is like a big yeah. uh, research study with maybe tens or hundreds of patients comparing a herbal medicine to placebo or something else. Um, and a systematic review includes several of those. And so 34 systematic reviews means there's been probably at least three, four, five times as many randomized controlled trials, mm. which is this sort of top notch of evidence that uh, people look for. And we organized them in a league table um, with the ones that had the biggest effect at the top and then the ones that had the least effect at the bottom. And it was very interesting. So the one that came out top with the biggest effect on reducing HbA1c was aloe vera. Aloe vera? Which people don't think of no. <laughs> for, for diabetes. But um, the, the leaf, the fresh leaf crushed up, or the juice, um, reduced HbA1c by 0.99%. So that's almost 1%. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, and by comparison, metformin, which is a standard anti-diabetic drug that we use, would reduce um, HbA1c on average by about half a percent, 0.5 percent. Wow. So it's about twice as effective as, as wow. metformin from these um, admittedly much smaller studies than mm. the ones that we have on metformin. Mm. And then uh, next on the list was uh, espagula, uh, psyllium seeds, which is basically used as a laxative. So that's not something you would probably cook with. Mm -hmm. um, unless you had a problem with constipation, maybe you might put it on your porridge or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the next one after that... Is that, is that the same as psyllium? Sorry. Yes, psyllium. Yeah, psyllium yeah. husk. So that's what you might find in supermarkets or yeah, health Fiber food gel stores. or that sort of gotcha. thing. Gotcha. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So that was number two on the list. That also reduced HbA1c by about 1%. And the next thing on the list was fenugreek. Fenugreek seeds. Fenugreek seeds, yeah. Wow. So we, we call that, we, we use the leaves in uh -huh. uh, Indian cooking or me right. metis. Uh, yeah. But people do cook with the seeds as well. We do, they? yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And so after reading that, I had some discussions with, in fact, some patients from Asia who were in the previous practice where I worked. And they told me that they would soak the seeds in a glass of water mm. overnight and then drink the water from it. That was mm. how they would take it. And in fact, I'm really enthusiastic to learn from you what recipes there are that yeah. you can make with fenugreek. Because <laughs> I bought some seeds and I tasted it. And I thought, hmm, it doesn't taste great. I'm not quite sure. And I looked up a few recipes. I'm not quite sure how I would incorporate that. But it seems that people who take it for diabetes are more using like a, a powder and taking it as capsules. Mm. 
Or I, there were a couple of studies from India where people had actually incorporated the powder into chapati flour. Okay. And they were making chapatis with, um, you know, the fenugreek powder sort of incorporated gotcha. into them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that seemed to have quite a good effect. Fascinating. Um, yeah, absolutely. And then, so the next one on the list after that was nettle, green nettles. Green, the, the, the green nettles the, that just the grow everywhere. plant that grow, grows everywhere. <laughs> okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, <clears throat> and that one seemed to have quite a big effect in some studies. Other studies had less of an impact, but certainly the best studies show that it also reduced HbA1cy by quite a big amount. Wow. So I've taken to cooking nettles from my God. I don't have diabetes, but <laughs> yeah. I've got a very good friend um, in Switzerland, a, a, an Italian friend, who taught me a, a recipe for nettle risotto. Oh wow! Which is really tasty. So you basically, if you've got if you've got a garden in England, you've probably got nettles in it somewhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so instead of just chucking them in the compost bin, you can actually cook them. You fry them or you you boil them and then mix them with rice and and it makes a really good risotto amazing yeah amazing. really tasty so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um i mean obviously the studies weren't looking at nettle risotto they were looking at nettle powder but <laughs> yeah, you know sure. i mean you can imagine that that might have an effect sure yeah yeah um and then there are a few chinese remedies on the list um mm -hmm. that are complex mixtures of plants that so are probably not something you could easily bring in your diet okay but then the loss the last one on the top uh, six in the list is nigella sativa which is the black seed gotcha yeah um, we use that quite a bit yep Love so people it. put it in naan bread mm, um yeah i've got a really nice uh, a friend of mine suggested that you could put it into stir fries and it actually works really well yeah. in a stir fry with yeah, yeah. you know other vegetables and stuff amazing and that also reduces hba1c you have to take like two grams a day of it um you know obviously over a period of time um, and that reduces your HbA1c by 0.7%, which is, again, better than metformin. Yeah, definitely. And then yeah. there's a lot of other plants on the list. And interestingly, some of the more traditional plants that people would traditionally associate with diabetes, like cinnamon, for example, mm. didn't seem to have a big effect in these studies. Wow. Um, so, it, yeah, I mean, yes, herbal practitioners recommend cinnamon, and I love cinnamon, but... It's probably not the best thing for, you know, if you want to take it as a treatment for diabetes, it probably doesn't have a massive effect. Gotcha. Okay. Um, ginger was a little bit better, but again, not a massive effect. But all of these studies were looking at herbs individually. Mm. And of course, what we don't really know fully is how what, what happens if you combine them. Yeah. And potentially, I guess, if you put two or three different ones together, you might have a much bigger effects than any single one on its own because some of them probably have different mechanisms of action yeah. and different ways they work so for example the moringa that i mentioned we know that that one inhibits uh, some of the uh, uh, enzymes uh, and so works in that way a bit like um akabose, which is a, tr a conventional medicine gotcha. so it basically slows the breakdown of carbohydrates into mm. sugar mm. whereas something like fenugreek has um it it works more by uh, reducing your release of insulin and it also has um sort of soluble fiber that again slows down the release of of the sugars and a lot of the plants uh, remedies for diabetes have a lot of fiber fiber just by itself is probably good yeah because it slows down your you know reduces the glycemic index slows down the absorption of sugar so it helps to flatten that curve of mm. Uh, of sugar absorption yeah yeah that is fascinating and I, I guess one of my questions is with this systematic review um or the multiple ones that you came across where are these being performed because i certainly didn't hear about this at med school and i don't think it's a uk thing so are there particular countries that have a an interest in this are they coming from places like iran or india or, or china perhaps absolutely you're quite right <laughs> so in fact yeah i didn't know about them at med school either and i think most doctors and even most diabetes specialists most nutritionists in the uk don't know about mm. them because it's um it's just not part of our training unfortunately and you're right that most of these trials were not done in the uk so a lot of trials done in China on traditional Chinese medicine. Most of the fenugreek trials were done in um, India, Asia. 
Um, and the nettle trials, all of those were done in Iran, interestingly. Oh, okay. So Iran does do a lot of research on herbal medicine. Gotcha. Um, the fiber gel, the psyllium seed ones, a lot of those trials were done in the US, but sponsored by the company that makes fiber gel. Right. Mm. So there's potentially a conflict of interest sure. there. I don't know. It might be good to repeat some of those independently. Um, yeah, so not much of this has been done in the UK, and I guess we do need to do more because obviously we. It, the review only found plants that people had actually already done trials on uh -huh. and for which there was already a systematic review. And there's a lot of other stuff out there that hasn't had that level of research. Mm. So, for example, there's a, a really interesting Ayurvedic remedy called um, Gurma. Is Gurma. The, Gurma is the, um, I guess, the Ayurvedic name for it. Oh, the right. Latin botanical name is Gymnema sylvestri. Mm -hmm. So, um, if you... It's something that herbalists use quite a lot in the UK. It's part of um, Ayurvedic medicine. If you taste it, the, the sort of liquid extract of it, um, it, it has a, quite a magical effect in that you can't taste anything sweet afterwards. It completely inhibits your sugar receptors on your tongue. Wow. So it's a favorite trick. And you know, I did a course in herbal medicine. And the herbalists, uh, people who are skeptical about herbal medicine should try tasting this <laughs> yeah. stuff because yeah. uh, the, 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 the herbalist gave us a teaspoon of it and then he gave us a custard cream and it tastes like cardboard <laughs> and then um, you know uh, a square of milk chocolate just tastes like butter it's got no sweetness and it does it doesn't have any interest afterwards because oh you know it doesn't word. really taste yeah. you know, who would want to eat cardboard you know? yeah 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 <laughs> how long does that effect last for a couple of hours probably a couple of hours a couple of hours wow so, you know, like for people with alcohol who don't want to drink alcohol, we give them antibus yes. because they get bad side yeah. effects. So for people who have a really sweet tooth and can't stop eating sugar, gymnema would be a really good solution because you just take a teaspoon of it. And then afterwards, you, you wouldn't want to eat anything sweet for the next couple of hours because wow. <laughs> wow. you lose all the pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So herbal medicine is super powerful. I mean, that, I mean that, if you want convincing that herbal medicine works, mm. uh, uh, take taste gymnema and you know you don't need to read any research afterwards. yeah yeah i mean whether it has any effect longer term on diabetes um there's been less research on it which is why it didn't mm. come up in our umbrella review mm. but that i was just googling earlier and actually found that someone has now done a randomized control trial of it and it does reduce your hba1c by about half a percent so probably about as good as metformin wow wow so that's just using it maybe as a capsule but in fact if you took the liquid on your tongue and it of course people who like sugary sugary things wouldn't want to use it because yeah you, you would lose all the enjoyment of yeah absolutely. eating sweet sweet stuff but if you you know if you have a sugar addiction you can't stop you know you're one of those people who can't stop eating chocolate once you start mm. then having having a bottle of gym Nema is probably quite a good way of that's fascinating controlling yeah, yeah. controlling that on the subject of skepticism around medical herbalism i guess um you know, doctors who were trained within the UK system or the US system might look at these systematic reviews and say, oh, well, those were done in Iran. They've got different, you know, methods of, of rigor and we can't really trust it, particularly if it's coming out of China, all the rest of it. What do you say to those kind of skeptics around the, the studies? And is there a part of you that sort of agrees that we should be repeating them uh, on, on, in, on European soil? Or do you think they're, they're just as good as the way we would do it over here? So, uh, I think that's a really good question. Um, so, all of the systematic reviews assess the quality of the studies that they included. Mm. Um, and I guess, obviously, it's variable. Um, so, some of the studies are of poorer quality than, than others. So, yes, obviously, I would probably have to go back and read each of them in, in detail to remember, remember the details of them. But, um, yes, I mean, some things... You know, for example, the the results on psyllium seeds was based on only three studies. Mm. Um, and those were done in, in the US. But as I mentioned, they were some of them at least were funded by the company that yeah. sells the stuff. So that's something where you would probably want to repeat it. And I guess the other issue is what's the best dose? What's the best preparation? Mm. Mm. Because, um, for example, the fenugreek, as I mentioned, there were lots of different preparations that people used. As I mentioned, some people incorporated it in their flour for making, yeah. uh, for making chapatis. Other people took it in capsules. 
maybe those things aren't equivalent. And I think those sorts of issues as to how you dose it is important. The nigella seeds, uh, there, was a, there was some studies using the oil, some using the powder. So the ones using the powder appear to have a larger effect than the ones using the oil, for example. Um, aloe vera, uh, there were studies using the capsule, uh -huh. uh, and those seemed to be less effective than the ones where they were giving a fresh juice or oh, the crushed okay. uh, plants. But the, there were only one trial each of the fresh juice and of the crushed leaves. So I guess it would be good, you know, from a scientific point of view, it's always good to repeat research and do it better. Mm. Um, and there are also lots of other plants that haven't had that you know, proper research done on them. So um, absolutely, there's always space for more research. Yeah. But I think the key point is, uh, yes, of course, there will always be need for more research. And uh, there's so many plants around the world that are used for diabetes. There's potentially, you know, you could spend the next 100 years doing clinical trials on them. Mm. Uh, and of course, all that needs to continue. But I guess what really surprised us is that there's already a huge body of research that's been done and actually, I think we need to, doctors need to stop telling people there's no evidence, mm. because it's not true. There is evidence. And, and, you know, I think the beauty of a lot of this stuff is that it's not really harmful. So the worst case scenario, even if it doesn't work very well, it's not going to do any huge damage. In fact, most of these studies, people were taking the herbal uh, medicine alongside their conventional medicine. Mm. They weren't being told to stop it. Mm. Um, and there were almost no reports of any serious side effects. I mean, a few people complained of uh, maybe uh, upset stomach, nausea, or diarrhea. Mm. And there was one report in one study of someone who had too low a blood sugar, a hypo. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and that was a person who was already taking insulin for their diabetes. Gotcha. Mm. So I guess if you're already on insulin, then you need to be a bit careful because you don't want to give yourself a hypo. I mean, of course, insulin could give you a hypo even if you're not taking anything yeah, else. Yeah. But there were no reports of hypos. That's uh, when you have too low a blood sugar level in people who are not taking insulin. Mm. So it seems to be perfectly safe to take alongside your yeah. conventional treatment. Um, so it seems to me to be a bit of a no brainer, really. And, and also, I think from my personal experience, so I spent quite a few years working in East Oxford Health Centre, where we have a very diverse population, people from about 40 different countries registered at the practice. And a lot of patients, especially the non-British patients, mm. are really interested in herbal medicines. And don't many people just don't like taking pills. And, and in fact, the worst control of diabetes, people with the highest blood sugar levels, were often from you know, minority ethnic groups and so on. And often doctors are tearing their hair out. What can we do to improve the diabetes uh, control in, 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 in these patients? And very often they come being quite enthusiastic about a herbal remedy yeah. that they've got. Or, or even maybe if they weren't too scared of their GP, they might even ask for advice on, yeah. on which herbal remedy might work. Mm. Um, and so being able to give some evidence-based advice that, you know, if you want to try a herbal, maybe fenugreek would be good, but maybe don't bother with cinnamon because that's probably not going to make a massive difference. I mean, that could be really valuable. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, I've got some friends, colleagues in Switzerland who've started to put together an information booklet with different uh, information on those evidence-based herbs, plants, foods, in fact, spices which can help management of diabetes. So it's sl coming at it from a slightly different angle because traditionally we've been focusing on these are the foods you need to avoid. You know, anything with sugar, carbohydrate, <laughs> high in fat, you need to avoid. So it's quite a negative message. And of yeah. course, all of that is true and it's important. But here's a positive message. You know, these are some foods you could choose to add to your diet. They're going to help um, with with control of your diabetes. An interesting one is the bitter melon, Corella. Oh, okay, yeah, um, Car we call it Corella. Corella. Uh, uh, Corella in um, uh, in my household. But 
my mum prepares it, and it's yes. uh, but you have to sort of because it's quite bitter. Yes, very you, bitter. You have to sort of mellow it with spice and stuff. But it's literally one of my favourite things that my mum makes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, very popular in um, uh, patients in in East Oxford, and mm. in fact, there was a systematic review on Corella, which was it wasn't one of the most effective, but it did have an effect. Okay, it was certainly better than nothing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, quite a lot of diabetic patients really like that, yeah. and having that as part of your diet is. The, there's a loads of thing to do. Yeah, there's loads of different ways in which this is coming from my mum now. I haven't actually looked into it, but there's loads of different ways in which uh, people prepare it, right? So you can mm -hmm. either have it sort of sauteed, like my 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 family make it, uh, but you can also have it as a juice. You can right. also have it as a yes. powder. Right. You dehydrate it and put it into a powder, and you add it to water, or whatever. Yes. Uh, so there's various ways in which people. I'm not too sure which one is more effective, but it is fascinating that this is stuff coming from different ethnicities in different yes. parts of the population and that was going to be one of my questions actually yes. regarding you know the location of where you tend to get more research in this field seems to marry quite nicely at least from my anecdotal experience of a being an Indian family myself but also b working within an urbanized environment where I see lots of people from diverse uh, countries yes. and backgrounds where they might be a lot more receptive uh, to the idea, or they were gr they grew up with the idea of herbal medicine being alongside conventional medicine or pharmaceuticals or whatever you want to call them. Um, is that something that y you noticed? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, definitely. In fact, that was one of the things that really got me interested in this whole area, um, because as I mentioned, I'm the practice where I worked in Oxford was very multicultural, and um, I did have patients coming to say, you know, doctor, what do you think of this medicine that I've I've had sent over from Pakistan, yeah. or Afghanistan, or whatever. Um, and often it was just a powder and I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just in a little baggie, yeah, yeah, no, exactly. no name on it or anything. Exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> but uh, no, absolutely. And um, as I'm sure you know, the risk of diabetes is much higher in uh, patients of Asian origin, but also black African origin. So in the UK, white British population, it's about six, seven percent, the prevalence of diabetes. In uh, black uh, ethnic groups, it's about 12%. And in some Asian ethnic groups, especially Pakistan, it's up to 20%. 20%? The age standardized prevalence wow. of diabetes is massive. And also, the control of diabetes is less good. Um, so there was a study in, in Glasgow, in Scotland, which showed that the percentage of uh, diabetic patients who had poor control, which was defined as having HbA1c less, uh, sorry, greater than 7.5%, which is the sort of target that we treat to. So in white patients, white Scottish patients, it was 47% were above that, so poorly controlled. So that's pretty bad already, mm. 47%. For uh, black patients in Glasgow, it was 57%. And for patients of Pakistani origin in Glasgow, it was 66%. So two thirds wow. had poor control of diabetes and obviously that then translates into more complications so heart disease kidney disease all the rest of it mm. so it's really important to you know redouble our efforts to try and improve control of diabetes especially in patients from ethnic minorities and this is a real opportunity mm. because this is something that people are really excited about they find it interesting as you say it's part of people's culture what they grew up with and if medicine can embrace that and say look you know this is something that you can do to help your diabetes. I think it would help to engage people more, get them more interested, and maybe then, you know, take on board some of the other advice as well about reducing carbohydrates and stuff. Mm, mm, absolutely. Um, but yeah, I, I, I completely agree that I think people who've come from a different culture are probably much less skeptical about herbal medicine than maybe, you know, your standard white British person who over the decades has been indoctrinated that, you know, this stuff is not scientific, there's not much evidence that it works. And But even there, I mean, I think quite a lot of white British people actually are interested in herbal oh, yeah. medicine. Yeah, I yeah. think it's just a lot of people automatically assume their doctor's going to have a negative reaction to it and then they don't even bother mentioning it. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Because over the years, I mean, traditionally, medicine has been quite negative about, you know, herbals and stuff. And I think often people have been sort of had negative comments made like oh that's a load of rubbish or don't bother with that there's no evidence yeah, yeah. so a lot of people i think don't even bother asking their doctor yeah, about it absolutely and i guess you know when we look back at these studies and obviously it's impossible to design to design the perfect study and particularly if you're doing a review 
of existing studies. You, know, you can't go back and tinker with them. But let's say we were starting from a clean slate. What are the issues with using HbA1c as a marker itself? And what would be perhaps a better way of measuring the anti-diabetic effect of a, either a pharmaceutical or a, or a herbal medicine? And B, in terms of the heterogeneity, in terms of the actual substances used, we mentioned powders, oils, um, the actual uh, plant itself in a juice, like aloe vera juice. I guess you'd ideally want to you know, do the, the, the review on a specific form and just use studies grouped in with those. Yes. Um, so yeah, what, what, what would you do differently if you, if you did have a magic wand and you could change everything? <laughs> okay, <laughs> I wish I did have a magic wand. Even though my name's Merlin, unfortunately I don't have one. <laughs> I don't want to go there. But <laughs> <laughs> no, so well, uh, first of all, in terms of how you measure the effect on diabetes, there are lots of different measures that people use. I mean, as I mentioned earlier with the study on Moringa, the simplest thing to do is just to measure people's actual blood sugar. But obviously that's a short-term measure, mm. and it's not fasting blood sugar is, is one measure, but it's only it's a bit of a snapshot in time. It mm. doesn't really tell you how good your diabetes control has been over the last few months. So HbA1c is better that it's giving you an average of how your control has been over the last two or three months. I mean, obviously, you know, the, the absolute um, gold standard, which has been done for some of the modern medicines like metformin, is looking at mortality effect on, you know, does this actually save lives? Mm. Does it reduce deaths? But that requires massive numbers of patients and, you know, very long-term follow-up, obviously. Mm. So I would say that HbA1c is quite a good compromise, but mm -hmm. obviously you need to have a follow-up of at least two or three months. Mm. I mean, there are some studies that only follow people up for a few weeks, and that really isn't long enough to know what the true effect is. And, mm. and I guess if you can follow people up for six months or a year, that would be even better, because I'm sure, you know, it takes a while to actually have an impact. Yeah. So I guess if I was starting with a clean slate, I would, I would want to follow up patients for a year. I would want to check their hemoglobin, maybe, every, I mean, HbA1c every, every three months over that period of time. And obviously, as you say, you would want to pick the preparation that seems to be the most effective, either from uh, what herbalists or traditional medicine recommends or from what the existing evidence is. Yeah. Um, but yes, I mean, there have been trials done on all sorts of different preparations of some of these herbs and I guess I would I would go with the one that seemed to be the most effective. Um, if you could pick one preparation for all of them that appears to have the largest effect which one would you go for? Would it be a tincture, an oil, a powder, a capsule? Ooh, I think that's on a case-by-case -case basis it depends on which herb. Mm. So as I mentioned for the aloe vera it was a fresh leaf and the fresh juice that seemed to have the largest effect. For the um, psyllium, that's a powder. Mm -hmm. That's like, uh, you know, the fiber gel sachets. Mm. For the nigella seeds, it was the powder again. But, you know, there weren't any trials on actually using the whole seeds in, in cooking, for example. Gotcha. Mm. So it was powder, it was oil. There wasn't a trial on the, on the, on the other. Uh, for fenugreek, I have to be honest, I can't remember which one came out best. And the review on fenugreek was a bit old. Yeah. Um, so we're actually in the process of updating it now. So oh, right. with colleagues, we're going to redo it. Look, there are more trials. And in fact, we're collaborating with the university in China. So we're going to look at all the trials done in China as well, where they use fenugreek. And hopefully when we finish that, that will give us a lot more uh, clearer information on what is the best preparation of fenugreek and the best dose. Yeah. The best yeah. dose to take. That'd be awesome. And in terms of um, aloe vera, I just want to double click on that for a second. So aloe vera fresh appears to be best. Uh, do, do you remember how much uh, that they would yes. use? Yes. So if, if it was the crushed leaf, it was 15 grams twice a day. 15 grams twice a day. Okay. So that's a fair amount. I'm just thinking of the leaf because it comes out yeah. like a gel, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. 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 And then you just take it as a... Okay. I guess so. <laughs> and the juice, um, the studies on juice, fresh aloe vera juice was, I think, 150 mils once daily. Oh, right. Okay. That's goes. quite expensive. It, it, is, it could be quite expensive. So in in uh, this country, I guess yes. it would be, but in the, the more sort of exotic climates where you find aloe vera just growing. Well, aloe vera grows really, you can easily grow it as a house plant. Oh, can you? So yeah, I've got, in fact, I've got so many at home that my wife keeps nagging me to get rid of them <laughs> and give them away. 
I mean, I I bought one in a in a fate about fifteen years ago, and it's had so many offspring. I mean, I've probably donated literally hundreds to different you know fates and things <laughs> over the play, uh, you know, or just given them as to, to friends and stuff. And it just keeps sprouting up more babies all all, all the time. I keep repotting them and. You know, it just doesn't stop. So That's it's, brilliant. It's very easy to grow it yourself. On it, all you need is a, a you know, well, a window sill. You don't even need a window sill, really. You can. It grows very well indoors. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Okay, cool. So aloe vera, and and on aloe vera, um, we talked a bit about the mechanism of action for psyllium husk. You know, creating essentially um, uh, a barrier of absorption. So you're going to have less of the sugars mm -hmm. absorbed uh, yeah. quicker. So you essentially give your body a bit of time to release the appropriate amount of insulin and you have a nice sort of uh, glucose um, uh, flattened curve. What happens with aloe vera? Does it work in a similar way? Is it the fiber constituents or are there other sort of compounds that might be working? That's a very good question. And I have to be honest, I'm not 100% sure. I suspect that, I mean, I know that aloe vera itself and the gel have a laxative effect. Mm. Um, and I, I guess the gel may contain some sort of soluble fibers, but whether it has another pharmacological activity i would need to look that up and get back to you because i'm good. not i'm not 100 percent sure all good uh, any particular mechanisms uh of action for the other top six that struck you perhaps um yes so the fenugreek um the it acts to reduce the insulin production which is interesting um because I don't know exactly how it does that. Yes, so uh, fenugreek stimulates release of insulin and it also contains gel forming fibers that delay the stomach gotcha. emptying yeah. and interferes with glucose absorption from the intestines. So that's super interesting because that's working on multiple actions yeah. uh, compared to the drugs that we use. So we use a yes. plethora of different drugs to do those, those yes. different actions. Yes. That's fascinating. Exactly. It's, uh, uh, many herbs are like that. They're like a natural combination therapy yeah. that already have a number of different um, activities. And obviously you could incorporate two or more herbs in you know, a recipe or whatever. Mm. And in fact, um, my colleagues in Switzerland have been trying that approach with the recipes and a list of plants that can be useful for diabetes. They've been trying that in Ethiopia. Mm. And I think that the study is still underway. They've got about 63 patients, I think, on board already. But their preliminary results are really promising that just that approach of advising patients, OK, here's a list of herbs you can take, try and incorporate them into your diet. You can pick, you know, two or three from the list. And they found really significant reductions already in those patients' HbA1c levels mm. just through that provision of advice. There is um, uh, sort of an ongoing discussion amongst people who are type 2 diabetes researchers, but also uh, metabolic health researchers, uh, in that we should be minimizing glucose excursions, even in a non-diabetic population. Uh, there are certain benefits to ensure that we're not having these swooping up and down curves that you know w w we see if we're having a big sort of carbohydrate-rich meal. Um, we, we might not necessarily be labeled with the type 2 diabetes label or the pre-diabetes label, mm -hmm. but there is a growing concern that these precede diabetes by 10 years or so, and they mm -hmm. precede insulin or insulin resistance precedes everything. Um, what's your opinion on that? And do you think there is a place for herbs uh, to have a role in preventing even the onset of pre-diabetes before we get to the point where we're even using herbs to treat people in the first place? Yes, absolutely. And I mean, I think <clears throat> I didn't mention it, but a lot of the studies also were looking at pre-diabetes. So our review was focusing on diabetes, but pre-diabetes is just, you know, it's a spectrum at the end of the day. And we have sort of maybe artificially picked a point on that spectrum where we say, okay, if your HbA1c is above six, then you're diabetic. If it's below six uh, or 6.5, then you're pre-diabetic. Um, but, you know, it's all a spectrum and these things are going to have the similar effect at whatever point on that spectrum you take it. Mm. Um, and incorporating these herbs in your diet, I'm sure, will help um, if you're pre-diabetic or in the prevention of diabetes as well. I mean, obviously, one of the key issues is weight loss as well. Um, and I think if you're having a lot of, a lot of sugar, carbohydrate, and it's being absorbed very, very rapidly, that's going to impact your risk of diabetes so so absolutely and in fact um 
For our next review on fenugreek that I mentioned, we're going to be looking at it in pre-diabetes as well, but I, I'm pretty sure that it will have a similar similar mm. effect. In yeah. Some of, yeah. And we've had a history of using um, compounds like these in medicine for years, right? I mean, if we think about metformin, what the origins of that are, I yes. mean, for anyone that might be on the fence about whether we should be even considering herbal remedies, perhaps we could use that as an example of how it essentially stemmed from uh, a, a plant. Exactly, yes. Yeah. So I think uh, many doctors and probably most people don't realize that metformin is a derivative from a natural product. So it actually comes from, uh, well, it was derived from a, a, a compound called galagene, mm. which comes from uh, a, a plant called goat's root, Galiga officinalis, um, which is a European traditional herbal remedy for diabetes. Sorry, I want to correct it come that. From a... It was actually guanidine was the compound. Guanidine. Guanidine. Okay. Uh-huh. Guanidine is the compound from goat's root. Um, and basically, metformin is two guanidine molecules stuck together uh, with a with a methyl group uh, stuck on, and and that's how metformin was made. So it actually derived from a natural product. Mm. And so, was there historical use of the original compound? Yes. For... Oh, yes. Right. Yes. So a goat through is still used by herbalists in the UK, and it's part of the traditional European, um, you know, pharmacopoeia uh, as to what was used for for diabetes, but. But even before that, so going back to the ancient Egyptians, the Abus papyrus, which dates from 1550 BC, was already suggesting a high fiber diet really? for diabetes. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that's something that people have known about for a long time. That's amazing. I went to Egypt recently, actually. Uh-huh. We went to Cairo and we visited the pyramids and uh, papyrus is, uh, I mean, they wrote everything on papyrus and stuff. It's an amazing product in itself. A- a- absolutely. <laughs> and I guess the only reason that we know about it is because they actually wrote it down. But, you know, many other cultures in the world, they don't have such a long yes. written history, even here in Europe. You know, our, our writing probably only dates back to the Romans or whatever. So, uh, but it, probably most cultures throughout the, the world used some form of herbal traditional medicine for treating diabetes, because obviously the term diabetes is relatively modern, but actually traditional healers in Africa are able to diagnose diabetes without even resorting to blood tests. They basically, well, in the old days, they used to taste urine to Mm. see if it tasted sweet, Mm. or an alternative was they would get people to pee next to an anthill and see if the ants come (laughs) and eat the urine. Yeah, 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 yeah. (laughs) It's a good thing we've moved on from that. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, you mentioned cinnamon here, which is quite, a, like mm-hmm. people are on the fence about cinnamon. It's interesting you found it uh, didn't have an effect. Was there uh, a preserved effect of cinnamon depending on the type of cinnamon? Because from my understanding, there's two key types, right? There's um, there's a true cinnamon or Ceylon cinnamon, and there's cassia. Um, and the cassia I've heard is in, in some cases, polluted with coumarin uh, and that can have the anti-diabetic effect but it's not something that we see with Ceylon cinnamon. Did they differentiate what types of cinnamon there were or did they just use any old cinnamon? So some of the reviews grouped them together and some of them um, looked at them separately. So the latest systematic review that was done on cinnamon um, Mm. by Namazi et al um, didn't separate out the different types of cinnamon. They, mm. were all, they were all lumped together. Yes, yeah, so for many of the trials, actually, the type of cinnamon used wasn't even clear in the ah. publication. Mm. So this particular um, review included, yeah, the, the, this particular review included 18 randomized controlled trials on cinnamon. Um, interestingly, quite a lot of them were done in Iran. Okay. Nine of them were done in Iran, two in Thailand, one in China, two in the USA, one in England, one in Pakistan, one in the Netherlands. And most of them actually didn't specify which type of cinnamon they were using. Um, Only one, two, three, four, seven of them specified that they were using the cassia. Cassia versus the Ceylon. That's really interesting. But they didn't analyze them separately. And of course, with all herbal remedies, there is an issue about quality and yeah. quality control. That's one thing I was going to ask you about. In terms of, 
you know, if anyone's listened to this and perhaps they are pre-diabetic and they've spoken to their general practitioner and they've got the go ahead to try some lifestyle interventions before they might be onboarded onto a pharmaceutical as per their advice, like how would one go about choosing the right preparations or good quality herbs and, and spices to potentially use in a medicinal manner? I mean, I think if it's something you're incorporating in your diet and you're cooking with, then I guess it's the way you would choose any ingredient when you go when you go shopping. I guess the quality becomes more of an issue if you're taking a medicinal product like a capsule mm. or, uh, or something. So I think in those cases, I would go for looking, first of all, has it got a traditional uh, medicine registration? Mm. There is now in the UK a system of traditional product registrations. Oh, right. Um, uh, which means they have to go through a certain number of quality tests, etc. So those would be the ones, you know, if I was buying an actual herbal medicine, I would look for that um, traditional herbal medicine certification. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and in fact, I think it's now illegal to market something as a herbal medicine in the UK without that. But of oh. course, there's still a lot of herbs that are being that get around that by being marketed as food supplements yep. without a particular claim. So you do have to be a bit careful. And um, yes, I mean, I know people who've done uh, studies on things like St. John's work, for example, comparing the, the products in different supermarkets and found the quality can be extremely variable. Yeah, it's a, it's a real minefield for the consumer, right? Mm. Because the evidence in the studies might be using a standardized preparation of yes. high quality, but what you're actually able to access in your yes. supermarket or maybe even your local health food store That's might true. be entirely variable and have a real sort of, and which which is where I, I, I see the skepticism from general practitioners and other medics who can't ratify the quality of them versus the drugs that are held to quite high pharmaceutical sure. standards. Of course, absolutely. I, I, I accept that. And that's that's true, especially for the sort of capsule type formulations. But the good thing about the anti-diabetic plants is a lot of them are actually foods. So that doesn't apply so much for mm. foods. Yeah. Because I guess, you know, none of our food is quality controlled in the same way as a pharmaceutical product. Yeah. Would be. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, I guess most people know what to look for when they're buying food in terms of what's going to be good quality or not. Yeah, we spoke to Simon and he was like, we need to use the sniff test. You need to yes. smell that. You need to, you know, ensure that there's a good amount of flavor. And I guess mm. you sort of answered you, the, this next question that I had for you um, around the argument of it, should we be opt opt opting for um, isolated compounds? or the whole herbs and spices themselves, like where do we sit on that? Because there is a, a, you know, a huge interest in industry of isolating certain compounds, whether it be curcumin or resveratrol or quercetin, and putting it into a pill form that's very accessible for people, mm -hmm. and perhaps even being a very high quality. Mm. However, you're stripping away a lot of the benefits from the whole herbal spice Absolutely. that might be explaining the, you know, in this case, the anti-diabetic effects that we see. Absolutely. And um, <clears throat> being a bit cynical, I mean, I think one of the main reasons that people like purifying pure compounds and is that you can patent it and make a lot more money out of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but no, absolutely. I mean, I think many of these plants, there's probably more than one compound that's working together to, to produce the effect. Um, and so it's likely to probably have a bigger effect I mean, uh, as a as a sort of whole herb rather than a purified compound. Bearing in mind that a lot of these things as well work through the fiber content, mm. and fiber obviously isn't a, a pure compound. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and with multiple subtypes, and yeah, I always think about it from the perspective of whole plants because you have that entourage effect, don't you, of all the different um, compounds that you find. It's not just the quercetin and the vitamin E that's having an impact. It's yeah. the the fact that you have it in combination and it goes back to that synergistic effect that's a bit yes. of an unknown with all these different herbs and spices right absolutely absolutely and in fact you know then what happens when you add several plants together yeah 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 <laughs> Just, that's cookery <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and the, yeah that's kind of what it really interests me as well it's like okay well could we uh test some of these combinations that perhaps work better than other combinations you know people have sort of like 
uh, little heuristics of of how to get them the most out of the ingredients like mm -hmm. lightly steam them don't cook them for too long unless they're tomatoes in which case yes. you get different benefits from eating them raw versus cooked for a long period of time mm -hmm. so all these different like i think traditions that have been passed down are probably mm. encoded in some of the recipes that we still have access to Absolutely. Um, and that's why i always like to look at things through that lens as well yeah no it's really interesting and i think we've got a lot to learn from people who know how to cook things to make them tasty because i have to confess after doing this review i went to buy some carola um in the in the local asian supermarket and i tried cooking it and i have to say it was probably my cooking but it was revolting <laughs> yeah <laughs> so i'd really like to learn from someone who knows how to cook it how yeah. to make it taste good <laughs> uh, you're not alone honestly when you use it you really know how you need to know how to make it because i remember i found it once in my mum's um, in my family's fridge and I tried cooking it as I would do some aubergines or some courgette because it kind of looks similar to that. Mm -hmm. So I thought, oh, well, you know, just cook it like another nightshade. It doesn't work like that. It's very, very bitter. And mm -hmm. you have to use a bit more oil than you probably would do. You need to cook it for a little bit longer. Um, and that's why probably, you know, the powdered forms of gorilla are probably more uh, accept <laughs> yes. acceptable to, to people if they're coming at it for the first time. And of course, different people have different taste buds and they're used to different things. And I guess some some cultures, some families are probably more accepting of bitter tastes, whereas perhaps yeah. in, the, in the West, we're a bit more sanitized and intolerant to bitter tasting things yeah. i don't know i think it's something that we developed from childhood there's this really famous um article that was printed i think it was in the guardian and the new york uh some pa some paper from the uh america i think it was the new york times and it was a series of photographs and um recipes of breakfast from around the world and the the, the title of the article was what kids eat around the world and it was just children who were photographed next to uh what they ate in the morning from different parts of the world so brazil mm -hmm. india china thailand and obviously the us and the uk and you can just imagine sort of the image of the 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 british kids and the, and the american kids they had like we toes and lucky charms and you know all these sort of beige items and you go to somewhere like india and they have like a tali and they have all these different like lentils and things that that's for breakfast and you go to brazil or you go to different parts of uh, uh of asia or turkey and they have like hung yogurt and they have pickles and they have so what they're they're eating for breakfast is actually quite sour and and it kind of speaks to the acceptance of some of these different ingredients i guess as part of their normal diet yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. You, 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 I think you're doing a systematic review on patient perspectives of herbal right. medicine. Is that right? That's right. Yes. So we've, uh, I had a student who worked on it and um, we're just updating it now um, from different countries around the world. And that's also been really interesting. So there are lots of things that uh, encourage people to use herbal medicine. Part of it is culture, familiarity, advice from family and friends. Um, but also people who, for whatever reason, don't like taking modern medicine, who maybe have suffered side effects or just don't like taking pills. And the, the interesting thing is that a lot of patients who choose to take herbal medicine don't tell their doctor about it. Mm. The doctor doesn't ask them mm. because there's that sort of um, mistrust, as we were talking about earlier, that they're worried about how the doctor's going to react to it. Yeah. But I mean, yes, and many patients are enthusiastic about this, especially patients from um, ethnic minorities. Interestingly, most of the research done in high income countries, like in the UK, there's only been one study, which was in Scotland with patients of Asian origin in Scotland. Um, a few studies in the US, uh, again, focusing mainly on ethnic minorities. There have been no studies really asking, you know, what what do, does the average white British patient think about taking herbal medicine for diabetes? Mm. So no one's actually done that. Um, so we don't know. But most of the studies that were done found that people were really enthusiastic. So, for example, in, in the Asian community in, in Scotland, a lot of people really enthusiastic about taking and, and already taking um, herbal medicines. And yeah. diabetes. So there's definitely an opportunity there you know, to tap into that natural interest and, you know, just maybe add some evidence into the mix so that people are choosing the things that are likely to make the biggest difference. Yeah, yeah. Everything that we've talked about today, you know, um, underlines the fact that herbal medicines aren't inert. They are certainly powerful. There is evidence for them. There is acceptance for them. 
it's the foundation for some of the drugs that we most commonly use. I guess the, the next uncomfortable area that we need to address is what about the impact of the placebo effect? As we've been hearing more recently about antidepressants and disentangling the placebo effect from the genuine effect of those drugs, how do we disentangle the placebo effect, particularly if there are certain people in different ethnic groups that are more bullish on the idea of these medical uh, herbs? Sure. Well, of course, all of the studies that I was mentioning in the um, systematic reviews were randomized controlled trials. And the control group many times were given a placebo. So that automatically takes account of the placebo effect. So that means that the effect that was measured by the trial was on top of the placebo effect. Mm. So it was a difference between the actual active treatment versus a placebo. Of course, not all, the, not all of the trials included a placebo control. Some of them were against usual care. So in those cases, yes, there could be a placebo effect. But quite a lot of the studies were controlling against placebo. Mm. So I think we can discount that and say, well, not discount it. Obviously, the placebo effect is real, but say that, you know, a lot of these herbs, actually, there is evidence that they're better than placebo. Mm, mm, that's great. I want to dig into a bit about your background. So you sure. mentioned you, you work as a general practitioner. Yes. And you work, is it primarily or, or largely with, with uh, homeless patients? Yes, so I work as a GP currently at a practice for homeless patients in Oxford called Luther Street Medical Centre. Okay, yeah. great. And and talk, me a bit about, uh, talk to me a bit about the arc of your career. So how, how did you go from practicing as a general practitioner, getting involved in medical herbalism and, and now you know, looking after patients from a, a disadvantage and, and a poor background? Okay, I mean, it's been, it's been a, quite a journey, I guess. Um, so I've been interested in herbal medicine research since even before I qualified. So I guess I also grew up in a household where my mum was really interested in herbs. She had her thyme and sage, I mean, European herbs, but she had all her herbs in the garden. She would make her soup with herbs every evening. She would often treat her coughs with thyme tea and yeah. when she got the menopause she would treat that with her sage tea yeah um so i i grew up with that sort of background and then when i was a medical student i went to do my elective in uganda in east africa um in a traditional healers clinic and i spent two months in a it was a, a local ngo that had been started by in fact the local mp who invited all the traditional healers of the area to come together into a cooperative where they shared their recipes. They had about 40 traditional healers and they made standardized medicines, herbal medicines for treating common conditions like malaria, worms, diarrhea. Um, and they actually had a small laboratory on the site where they would take blood samples and do m microscopy for malaria. Huh. They, would, they would look for parasites and, and um, eggs of worms in, in stool samples. And then they would prescribe their standardized herbal medicine right. for that. And my project, my first ever research project as a student was following up those patients who were being treated for malaria and taking blood samples from them to see what, what happens. Wow. Um, and uh, the majority of them got better, um, which was really interesting. So that, yeah. that got me really interested. And then um, I helped to start a network of people doing research on herbal medicines for diabetes. Uh, sorry, for malaria, not for, for, malaria. Di not yeah. for diabetes. Uh -huh. I've got diabetes on the brain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and was involved in a number of other studies on herbal medicines for diabetes. So I went to Madagascar for 10 months and we did a trial of a, an extract, a herbal extract from a local plant for reversing resistance to chloroquine, which uh -huh. was the standard treatment for malaria at the time. Uh, that was really interesting. And then uh, went to work in Mali in, in West Africa where uh, we were looking at a range of plants that were being used traditionally for treating malaria. Um, but then focused in on one particular plant called the Mexican poppy, Argimone mexicana. Mexican poppy. poppy. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. What's that? So it, the, the flowers look like a Welsh poppy, a yellow sort of poppy. The leaves look more like a thistle. They're very prickly. And it originates, as the name would suggest, from Mexico. But it's now become naturalized in much of Africa. Not sure why, but my theory is it maybe was a contaminant in maize seeds because ah. maize originally came from Mexico. Ah, but in any yeah. case, so in the particular village where, where we were working, the, the village chief, 
was a traditional healer, and he had learnt about the use of this plant from his grandfather. So there'd been several generations' experience of use. And in a, a survey that we did, the people who'd taken this plant had the best results, uh, were less likely to you know, have severe malaria, were most likely to um, improve from malaria. So we then ended up doing uh, an observational trial and then a randomized control trial comparing it against conventional treatment, wow. um, which showed that it was almost as good, not quite as good, but almost as good as conventional treatment. Almost and, as good, really? Uh, uh, in terms of improving symptoms, in terms of reducing in terms of reducing your parasite counts and clearing your parasites completely, it wasn't as good. But then in that context, people got reinfected very rapidly. So yeah. actually clearing the parasites wasn't the main thing. Right. But in terms of improving their symptoms and reducing their risk of severe malaria, it was almost as good as the conventional amazing. treatment. Wow. And bearing in mind that, you know, when you're in a village that's 40 miles away yeah. from the nearest health center with no electricity, no running water and very poor access to health care, you know, knowing that, that out of the 60 or whatever plants that people might use for treating malaria, that this one seems to work really well. That Giving people that knowledge is quite powerful. That's incredible. Wow. And it means that, you know, people know what they can use locally, um, even when uh, medicine isn't available, as unfortunately has got a lot worse recently because Mali, since I work there, is now sort of in a sort of permanent conflict situation mm. with the Islamic um, fundamentalists, etc. So, yeah, I mean, there are local things that can help. So uh, I think, you know, I've had qu quite a long passion of doing uh, research on herbal medicine and perhaps more re only more recently really started getting involved in doing trials of herbal medicine in the UK. Uh -huh. So through the University of Southampton, which has a, a team interested in integrative medicine, um, which has really given me an excellent opportunity to work on clinical trials here in the UK of herbal medicine. But it's a lot harder doing clinical trials here because the regulations obviously are much tighter than, sure. in, than in Africa. So there's many more bureaucratic loopholes <laughs> yeah. you have to jump through. And uh, basically, you can't do a clinical trial, a full scale clinical trial, unless the product is manufactured to GMP standards. And for many of the most promising herbal products, it's actually quite difficult yeah. to find one that, that meets that standard. Yeah, yeah. So um, you're limited from the pool of meds that you can. Yeah. And so, so clearly, your interest in herbal medicine was was started right at the start of your career. Yes. And now you're getting an opportunity to uh, research more widely, you know, via uh, reviews and every and and the like. What What about the the other sort of side to you, which is the uh, general practice and and homeless uh, patients? Right. So well it's really good to be able to offer people a menu of options um, in terms of what treatments people can take. And so in fact, although I don't practice as a herbalist, I do offer people advice on herbal medicines when they're interested in it. So particularly in the, in the homeless population, yes, diabetes is a problem. So in fact, recently we had a Polish patient who would not who has diabetes and who would not take he just did not want to take any conventional medicines for it and he had his polish recipe of different herbs that he wanted to take <laughs> which he gave me and i said to him well you know what you can try it but i mean his problem was unfortunately he couldn't actually access those particular herbs that he wanted easily here in the uk because right. he didn't have money to get them and he didn't have a kitchen to prepare them because he was so that that's a bit awkward a bit when people yeah. when people don't have a kitchen to actually cook or prepare their mm. herbal medicine then you're really reliant on stuff that you can buy in capsules or that's ready made yeah um but so we do have a homeless medical fund a charity that pays for various um treatments that the nhs doesn't pay for and so I do purchase through that, for example, St. John's Wort for depression, valerian for helping people to sleep. And that's something that I do offer to people who would be interested in it. Um, I mean, obviously, it's not as strong as your benzodiazepines or whatever for yeah. people who want to really be knocked out. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, for people who are open to exploring an alternative, um, it's definitely a good option. So what was that again? 
valerian, valerian for sleep okay for yeah. helping people to sleep or for anxiety are there any others that you think of go to because that's a very common problem you know i, I was oh, yeah. constantly asked about zopiclone and benzodiazepines and exactly stuff. and, and in you... fact we have a policy not to prescribe those because mm. they are so addictive and harmful in overdose mm. um we've i think probably one of the top causes of deaths in the homeless population is overdosing um and quite often prescription medicines are part of that whether wow. it's benzodiazepines or z drugs or gabapentinoids or opiates so um, we try and avoid all those things uh, as much as possible so yeah it is really useful to have an alternative so i would say valerian is the one that i use the most for helping people to sleep. Mm. We are lucky also in having an acupuncturist who comes to our practice. Oh, we, wow. Again, paid through the charity, not paid through the NHS. Yeah. Um, but that's really helpful for pain, um, chronic pain sort of issues. Amazing, yeah. Um, if there was a, putting type two diabetes to one side and antiparasitic um, herbals as well, if there was a an ingredient or a herb or a spice that you think is a good all rounder to have that we tend not to have in our cooking, like, you know, ginger or fenugreek or, you know, nigella. Uh, is there sort of uh, a powder you think that people might want to experiment with for general health and well-being benefits? Well, I would say the one that I would probably pick for that would be nigella seeds. Nigella seeds, okay. Because um, not only is it good for diabetes, as, as we've been discussing, it's also good for respiratory problems, for asthma, and believe it or not, they've done a randomized controlled trial in patients with COVID that showed that it was actually helpful really? in COVID as well. Wow. Um, yeah, a team in Saudi Arabia did that. Um, and. Uh, Bef I never used to cook with nigella seeds. Um, you know, it's just not part of my upbringing, I guess, but it's something that came out of the review. So I, I went out to the local Asian supermarket, bought a bag of nigella seeds. And um, now every time I make a stir fry, I stick it in and it's really nice. It's good. It's yeah. really tasty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I love, love it. My family likes it as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a great tip. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I know we started a conversation on Moringa. Moringa is not something I have used in my sort of um, stack of tinctures and powders and all the rest of it. I tend to have my, my supplements of which I have vitamin D3, something generally, you know, pr pretty bog standard. Um, I do have a greens powder that I, I use. It's got dehydrated spirulina and a whole bunch of other things that I've drunk for years. Moringa is something I keep on getting asked about. And in terms of the benefits that we talked about at the start of this pod, are there any others that maybe would be interesting to the listeners, perhaps inflammation benefits or digestive benefits or anything else that you come across with Moringa? Because it's getting very popular. Yes. Well, I have to be honest, I don't know. Um, beyond the nutritional benefits that it's um, very high in protein, in vitamins, in minerals, mm. and the anti-diabetic effect, it may well have other effects. I would need to go and look it up. I wouldn't be surprised if it does, but mm. I have to be honest, I don't know. Okay. I'm going to look into that. Moringa is definitely one that I'm getting asked about. And that sounds like it could be a good all-rounder if it's high yes. in protein and it's got a lot of nutritional yes, value. Yes, absolutely. In fact, in um, you know many countries in Africa, it's being promoted as you know part of the um, treatment for malnutrition. Oh, really? Yeah, because oh, it's wow. so high in protein and uh, different vitamins and minerals. Yeah, I've tried it before. Uh, and I didn't like it. I think somebody gave it to me and I was like, whoa, that's very strong. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, just word of warning to anyone who's going to go out and buy a big bag of Moringa <laughs> for those benefits, you, you might want to try it uh, Yeah, I mean, I guess the way they take it in, in Mali is they take a teaspoon of it, maybe mix it in with soup or stew or whatever okay, you're making. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's slightly, I don't think, probably don't have to drink it neat. You yeah. Can, can mix it in with other stuff. I'll try it in a stew. Yeah, uh -huh. I'll try it in something tomato-based maybe. Yeah. To, yeah, to sort of marry those bitter flavors. Merlin, you're awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time today. This has been Thank super you. fascinating and I'm sure we're gonna have loads of follow-up questions. So I might have to hunt you down again and, and get you to come please, back. Please do, yeah, I'd be very happy to do that. Thank you. If you enjoyed that video, you'll love the library of content that we have on thedopterskitchen.com. Make sure you hit subscribe and we have podcasts in our library on brain health, well-being, supplements, and lots more. Have a wonderful day.